on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. Really what it boils down to is if I can make a living writing the books that I want to write, then I'm, that I find that's my definition of success. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. Yes, it is The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. Sounding very melodic and hunky. Have you done something to your microphone? It's not the, not the wrong way around, is it? Probably. <laughs> I can see the blue light. I'm not sure. That, yeah, I think that's yeah, right. That, yeah, you can see the blue light. That's good. Um, good. Excellent. Well, let us, before we do anything else, talk about anything else, and there are a few things to talk about, let us welcome our Patreon supporters this week. We have a new one, actually, T Tia Lindstrom. And it's also that time of year because the 101 course is now open for its summer airing for the two or three weeks, selfpublishingforum.com forward slash 101. But if your name is Julia V, you don't need to go there because Julia V is a Patreon supporter of ours and she has been plucked from the hat as a winner of the 101 course. We do that uh, every year for ads as well as for authors as well. Julia V, well done. And uh, I think you've been a Patreon supporter of, of ours since July 2017, my notes say here. So thank you very much indeed. And uh, can, I hope you enjoy the 101 course. So yes, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash 101 is the place to go. You can learn everything about the course, everything that's in there, and then decide whether it's for you. And we've still got that 24-month COVID special uh, payment plan uh, in place. Might be the last time we do that, uh, but it's there at the moment. And the 101 course, Mark, this is, we should just recap, this is the course the, when we sat and had that coffee in the BFI in 2015 and you said i've got this idea for an online course this really was the course you had in mind wasn't it uh yes yeah, i think it was it was certainly part of it um the the main part in terms of you know what to do if you're writing a novel about vulcans what you do to uh, turn that novel into um into a finished product and get it out there so but i i um yeah decided in the end it was a bit too big for me to think about doing that as a first project and then so what I did instead was make an even bigger course about advertising yeah um but no this this is um this is the kind of the the, the course that goes from the moment you finish till uh, well to getting the book out there and starting to sell copies building your mailing list your foundations all that kind of stuff but it's super detailed um you know it's hours and hours and hours of content and generally seems to be quite well well received we've had some nice had a nice email in uh, this morning actually I, I sent an email out today about um husband and wife teams that you know wives typically who've retired their husbands and i got i got an email back from someone uh it's another husband and wife team checking in um the wife had just retired the husband and was thanking us for the course so that was it's always lovely to see that that is excellent yes it's it's the platform builder uh, for those of us about to launch a book um, this is having everything in place to try and make a commercial success of that. Um, yeah, we'll be open for two to three, probably two weeks beyond this podcast. Um, and once again, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash 101. We do have a few short courses coming out. We'll talk more about those in the future weeks, one of them on launching a book, which is very apposite. So my book, little update. So I got my um, edits back from Andrew Lowe. He's done a really good job. I don't know how he works, how editors work with other people, but I was really happy with the way Andrew set things up. So he gave me, first of all, a style sheet where we agreed, he suggested and we agreed formats for various things, such as numbers and dates and, and so on, and ranks and so on, and aircraft names and capitalization and all that stuff that goes into my book as well. He then gave me a completely unexpurgated set of edits. So this was a lot of them, and this was every comma that's been moved, every full stop. Uh, in a Word document. It's 500 odd pages, the book. But in addition to that, he gave me a second version of it where he'd accepted and implemented all the stuff we'd agreed on from the style sheet. So I didn't have to really worry about Ooh, a good. lot of that stuff, having looked through it the first time and just Very made good. sure I was happy. And the second one's just left in there, the stuff that I really need to action where he's, or where he's made a, a, a change, like taken the last sentence out of a scene because he thinks it works better without it so that I can review that. And in quite a few places, I did do, I do a little bit of this. I don't know whether you did this in the early days of, 
of skipping conversation a little bit, summarizing, you know, so-and-so brought him up to date with where they were and then they went on their jolly way. And Andrew says, do you know what? We're reading this book to live these moments and there's important little character developments. I'd rather have that conversation in the book. So he's, he's made those suggestions quite often in my book. So I've, I'm writing these little scenes. They're not taking long and I'm really enjoying it. It's a nice, pleasurable part of the process, having not to worry too much about the bigger structure, just, just polishing these scenes. And I am, as of this morning, 352 pages through the 500 odd there are. So uh, making good progress. Have you booked a proofreader? He is the proofreader as well. He's doing so copy and proof. Is he going to see your changes? Yes. I'll okay. go back to him. Yeah, and I've got Great. little notes, little notes going back to him as well about where, you know, what I've done. Um, which means at some point, because sitting in the corner staring at me and I haven't touched since I posted onto Facebook is the blurb, mm -hmm. which I posted on your advice into our community group and got slightly traumatized <laughs> as a result of that. I didn't realize how traumatized I thought I, I can take criticism. That's fine. I'm, I'm I don't think it was that. I think what it was is when I came down, it was so all over the place of criticism and so relentless of it that I, I, I'm I, paralyzed now trying to write the blurb again. I can't write a sentence without thinking everyone's going to hate it. So that's where I am. I can't do anything. I've left it. Right. Now, now I'm finished. Okay. Well, you don't, you need to, people are not going to like everything, but I think the, I think the, the thing to take away from that exercise was that it wasn't good enough. It, you know, I don't yeah, well, think this is the sort of thing that's paralysed me. That kind of vague, it's not good enough. Well, you had plenty of reasons why it wasn't good enough, and I agreed with most of them. Uh, but you just gonna have to write it. I'd make it much shorter. You know, I, I said I'd help you with that if, yeah, if I can find Karen, a little bit of time. I'll, uh... Karen Ingalls and a few other people have offered to help me as well. I think Karen would be good as well. So mm -hmm. I will finally, when I get this, these edits done, I will dig that out again. I'd like to get it up on pre-order soon. It needs a blurb for that. I've got a cover, fantastic cover from Stuart. And I'm looking, I think... It doesn't need a blurb. doesn't need a blurb for pre-order. You could put um, a, a very a one sentence, the, the debut novel by James Blatch. Okay. Um, full stop, um, pre-order, you know, delivery in, whatever. You, know, you don't need to have the blurb for that. You'll, you'll get people, you'll get a lot of people from the community who will pre-order it. You could have anything on the blurb. Wouldn't make any difference. I, I often, if you look at some of the blurbs for my very long pre-orders, it will just be um, ignore Book the date... Seven. No, usually I say ignore the date you'll see below because I, I, it's not. I, I have a talk about this in the launches course that I've got. I've just finished. But I'll have very, very long year long pre orders, but they'll never they'll never go that long. So I'm just pushing out as far as I can to minimize the stress of having a date that I might not hit. I know that I'll hit if I have a, a year to write a, a novel. That's not a problem. Uh, but what I wouldn't want to do is kind of have the have the date I think it will go live, which may be three months time, and then find. I have a I have a deadline that is could be challenging if things happen. Um, but so if you look at those ones, I don't think I've actually got any live at the moment. But there would just be one line, nothing to do with the blurb. It would just be this book will be delivered sooner than you'll see below. Hmm. Mm. Oh well, that's an intriguing proposition. Good. Okay. It's been a bit of a journey, this, isn't it? See, people listening to this podcast since 2015. Well, the podcast comes to an end as soon as you publish it. <laughs> That's right. You'll, funny, still, you'll still be a rookie author. Yes, you'll exactly. be a rookie author for the next decade. So we actually rebranded okay. this when we got Huey Morgan in to do the voiceover. We took into account that I might actually publish the book with the wording of it. So did we? We did. That's why it says okay. and first time author rather oh, yeah. than okay newbie or whatever. What about when you're a second time author? That actually, I don't. I don't think we have to worry about that. <laughs> that is that'll be tw that'll be an issue for twenty twenty two. We can deal with it then. Oh no, twenty thirty two. I don't even know where you is. I lay awake in bed last night. I had my jab yesterday. Felt a little bit funny mm. in the evening. So lay awake in in, uh, in bed, and I just talked through the second novel completely. I'm still trying to refine it to try and make sure the story works before I go too far on the writing. Mm -hmm. I'm quite excited about that. I think um, that's one. I don't want to distract Andrew Lowe from his task at the moment of getting this over the line. Yep. But once that's done, I think it would be useful for me because he does development work as well to have a chat through with him of where I am with this structure and just so I can write it a bit more confidently. For me, I want to be, I'm not I'm not the um, Marie Force, oh, I wonder what's going to happen today. Sit down and write. I'm somebody who likes to know where we're going with my writing. So 
So that's that. Very exciting indeed. And today, uh, something that might be down the line for me and certainly is something that a lot of people think about. One of those things, a bit like audiobooks, you know, there's, there's work to be done, but there's potentially money on the table for the work that you've already done, repurposing that, that manuscript you've got. And this is translations. I will talk to you, Mark, uh, off the back of this interview about your translations experience. And there's a lot of overlap and certainly uh, when it comes to particular countries, our guest today, Tanya Ann Crosby, um, has found the same, I think, as you have found in your recent experience. But Tanya's carved out a little niche for herself here, being an expert in this area, has gathered quite a lot of contacts who can help you and perhaps circumnavigate some of the research and uh, effort that goes on to the point where you can get your books um, done by experts and done properly. Um, and before we actually go to the interview, I'm going to tell you that Tanya has very... Uh, uh, very kindly put together a PDF for us with a lot of resources on it to get you established on the translation uh, treadmill. And you can pick that up if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash translate. Nice and simple. Okay, let's hear from Tanya. Then Mark and I will be back for a chat. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. So Tanya Ann Crosby, welcome to the Self Publishing Show. I just had a little bit of information on your name. Maybe we'll come to that later on. We're going to talk about translations. Uh, I know it's an area people think about a lot. It's like money on the table if you don't do it. But people are also anxious about the mountain to scale and the costs involved and so on. So we'll try and demystify the process a bit if we can with you and also get a handle on the practical side of it, like how much it's going to cost and so on, the economics of it. Sure. But... As is the great tradition of the self-publishing show, we love to talk to authors and their cats, by the way. Your cat's making a guest appearance at the moment, if people are watching on oh, YouTube. He's, here. he's there. He's, here. he's, he's yeah. very welcome to be here. We like cats. Um, but we want to talk a bit about you as an author first, if that's okay, Tanya. So why don't you tell us, sure. uh, tell us your background in writing? So I've actually been doing this for quite a long time. I, I guess you might say I'm a veteran in the industry. I, just, I, I sold my first book in 1989. Um, and I sold it to Avon books. I, uh, they, I think they published my first 14, 15, something like that. I have no idea. You know, I should know that number because people <laughs> ask me all the time and I have no idea how many books I have or, you know, numbers, those numbers escape me. But, um, I think they did like my first 14 or so, something like that. And then, um, you know, the politics of the business kind of really got to me, um, uh, I won't go into that, but so I took about a, I took a 10 year hiatus from writing and that turned out to be one of the best things that I could have possibly done because, um, you know, I, I, I found my, uh, you know, the, my joy again, my joy of writing. I, I rediscovered that. Um, but there also during the time that I was out during the hiatus, I, I took jobs as an you know, editorial director for a stable of ma ma magazines in Dallas, Texas. Um, we, uh, I ran five magazines. Um, and then I also went to work for Match.com in the marketing department uh, and was their senior writer there. So I got all this wonderful experience that has, has actually helped me. It's like, it's like almost like serendipity. It all sort of led to exactly where I am today. Mm. That's interesting. The, um, the commercial writing kind of copywriting match.com. I think it's a dating service. Is that right? Online dating. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. I immediately thought of Paris Match. I thought you were working for Paris Match magazine, but uh, no, match.com. Uh, yes. And quite different though. I mean, I found this going from the BBC from a newsroom to novel writing. It's a very different style of writing. I think, I think it is helpful though. How did you find it helpful for your novel writing? So, you know, I don't really think it helped me so much with my actual write. Well, maybe it did, you know, at times it helped me to write a little more concise, you know, to really kind of narrow down, hone in on what I'm trying to say. But um, beyond that, it really has helped me with, um, you know, email marketing and um, uh, SEO and that sort of thing, you know, just how to speak to my, 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 my readers, uh, not just as, you know, an author, but as a marketer. Yeah, so. that bits of writing that a lot of authors don't find so easy, writing the emails, writing the blurbs and stuff like that. I don't like it, Fair enough. <laughs> but, but I, you know, I have to do it, so I might as well know how to do it. Yeah. So, and tell us a bit about your books, Tanya. What did you first write for Avon? Uh, his, I cut my teeth on historical romance. Uh, I and I, I think that's actually all I ever did with them. It wasn't until I came back 
from my hiatus that I actually, uh, I ventured into suspense. I did two books for Kensington and those were my suspense titles. And then I, that didn't quite work out the way I wanted it to. So I, um, and it wasn't really what I wanted to write. So I moved into women's fiction. Uh, that is where my heart is, women's fiction. But I am still writing historical romance. And also, but now it seems to sort of, um, it seems to be kind of metamorphosing into uh, historical fiction slash yeah. fantasy with a dollop of romance. <laughs> yeah. It's women's fiction is quite a broad term, really, isn't it? I find uh, a friend of mine is published writing women's fiction, and I think her books are mystery really the kind of family mysteries so mine are my, my women's fiction are you know they, they they probably are you know they're not as much like they don't lean toward the contemporary romance they're more literary but with um my my uh, my publisher um who, who published those particular books called them gone girl with heart so okay yes that's that sounds uh, uh, in genre um so you're published still or do you self-publish at all I do still, uh, actually, I'm mostly self-published now, although women's fiction is really tough, a tough market to break into yourself. So um, as a self-published author, so I, I, I don't, I don't really have designs on that at all. I will sell my women's fiction to a, uh, a publisher. Yeah. I have my eight shopping those now. So you're doing romance yourself. Or not, yes. As you say, not contemporary romance, historical romance still. No, so. right. Um, I have written contemporary romance and, uh, and suspense. I mean, I've just really been all over the place. And with my historical fiction, I've actually done like every genre, subgenre there is. Um, and that actually, you know, probably, I mean, it's been a good thing in that it's kept me fresh. And I think it's also been kind of a bad thing in that it's really tough to really grow yourself in any particular um, genre when you're skipping all over the place. Yeah. So, um, and here, you know, this is a lesson I've learned. I'm 30 years down the line, so I don't know. I'm still skipping around, so I guess it's a bad habit I can't seem to break. It is. Um, it is sometimes easier when you have one genre, uh, one set of books, uh, one author name, and yeah, people right. do it sometimes make life harder. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the wrong thing to do. You got to you got to write what you want to write, really, haven't you? But yeah. Well, and you know, these days, I think that's the way I define my, my success is that, you know, I've had, you know, I've made the list, I've done the things that, you know, there's, there are still things on my, on the horizon that I want to accomplish. But really what it boils down to is if I can make a living writing the books that I want to write, yeah. then I'm, that I find that's my definition of success. I'm really happy to be able to do that. And, and I'm doing, I'm doing fairly well. And, um, you know, I also, uh, I should also mention that, you know, um, I'm writing a little less these days. I'm pretty, a pretty slow writer. I'm, I'm writing a little less these days just because I started a publishing house. So I'm actually publishing like 17 other authors. Wow. So it, it kind of happened sort of, it sort of snowballed into what it is right now. Um, but really, um, I love, that's also a, a way that I measure my success is that if I can actually help, um, you know, uh, them as long with myself, you know, then I'm, I, I, I really kind of sort of love all the little successes that they have along the way also. And they kind of motivate me. Yeah. I published two authors and that's busy enough for me at 17. I am trying to scale up a bit at the moment. I'm slightly daunted by that's a lot of figures to go through every morning and then people to talk to and so on. So how do you find running that business? So that must be taking over a bit. Well, you know, I think that I've uh, got to slow down taking, a, I, I keep telling myself I'm not going to take anybody else on. I keep taking more people on. I mean, one of my authors, I keep telling her, you know, every day, I don't know if you um, know Kerrigan Byrne, but I, uh, so I keep telling her she's one of my dear friends as well, you know, and I, um, I keep telling her I'm not taking anybody on and she just goes, uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> she, <knows. laughs> she doesn't believe me at this point, but the truth is that I really do. Once I, I, I never really foresaw this being very big. I, I kind of don't see it as a publishing house. It's more of a white glove publishing partnership and um, with my authors. And so once it gets to the point where I'm not, finding writing time, which is, I'm, I'm about there, then it's time to not, um, to kind of leave off bringing anybody else new aboard. And that's kind of where I am. Yeah. So you do the marketing. I mean, you, you, what are your sort of marketing yeah. avenues for your authors? Uh, you know, we do a little bit of, you know, a little bit of everything, a little bit of Facebook ads, AMS ads, uh, Twitter, 
BookBub, and also AMG for, for oh, okay. um, yeah, for specific authors. Yeah, so, that's a big investment, yeah, once, yeah. AMG. Yeah. How did you yeah. get on with that? Just a little sidetrack on here on AMG. Is it something that's working for you? It's, I think it's a bit, bit more difficult to measure, isn't it? But It is a, di- a little difficult to measure. Um, I don't find that they work for well so well for me or my books or any of my author's books outside of KU. Um, you know, I do know authors who have used AMG ads for books that are not in KU and have found some success. But the thing is with the AMG ads is that it's just not a, it's, it's not a, uh, it's not a panacea at all. You know, you just, it, it's not, you're not going to put your books in and just, it's not going to, it's not magic. It works for some books. It doesn't work for all books. I have found just within my own list that um, there's a huge, that the results vary widely. So you have to be really choosy about the books that you put in and the series that you're um, that you're promoting. Um, and you're really going to make your money mostly on the page reads, I find. Yeah. So. Okay. We should explain AMG is a sort of in-house service offered to to you. So you you pay Amazon and they're experts on the inside of Amazon to do the marketing for you and report back. But it's a, it's a big buy-in, if I remember rightly, tens of thousands of dollars to, to start up with, with AMG. Yes, they're like about 10, each each ad is about 10,000. I mean, you have to commit for 10, you know, one ad, one book, $10,000. Yeah. But I think that the buy-in for new authors coming in is something like... Um, I want to say it's like 40,000. Yeah, I think that's about right. Yeah, good. Okay, well, let's move on to our core subject. Um, Tanya, we want to talk about translation. So is this something you had experience of from your traditional uh, world? Well, yes. So, you know, when I was published with um, with Avon, you know, they all of my books ended up, you know, I've had them translated into Russian, Italian, Chinese, you know, you name it. and so when I came to the, you know, uh, to, to the indie world, um, uh, and I don't think I, you know, for my, my genre fiction, I don't think I ever will go back to, to New York. I love the control I have just way too much. Um, and, you know, and I, and I do have an agent and she does uh, sell my foreign rights on occasion. Uh, but, you know, I, I just felt like when I first came to indie, um, I, I I, I did this thing where, you know, I, I kind of, you know, I, I was mad at the whole world and I got rid of, you know, um, I, I, I fired my last agent <laughs> and, and um, I went agentless for quite a while. Um, I, and I just kind of felt like, you know, it was me against the world and uh, just uh, I was rolling up my sleeve and just, just, just see what I could see. And uh, so when I came to the indie world, I just kind of decided, you know, I wanted to do the translations and it seemed like there were no avenues for this unless, I mean, there were just none unless your agent sold them. And at the time I wasn't, I didn't have an agent and I didn't, you know, I, I, most agents didn't want to take you on for just for your, your foreign rights because uh, they're hard to sell. Uh, and, um, you know, so I, I just, I really didn't want to say, I, I didn't want to hear the word no. <laughs> I just felt like there had to be a way. And uh, about three, four, no, I guess it's actually about five years ago now. Five years ago, I went through um, kind of a health scare and I was not well at all. And it was right about the time that people were writing more and more and faster and faster. And that's just not me. I just don't write that that fast. One of the reasons why I started this publishing partnership was so that I could slow down a little bit because I need my, I can write fast. I can write, you know, 10,000 words in a day, but I need my stories to kind of percolate, percolate back there. And I just need time. So that was just never going to change. And so I started thinking, you know, I was, wasn't feeling very well. I wasn't writing as much. And I thought, you know, this is now the time for me to start looking at translations and, you know, how to, how to figure this out. It's, it's a, it's a, it's just a puzzle that I had to find the solution for. Yeah, and I think it is a puzzle to people. It was a bit of an unknown area, isn't it? People don't really know where to start. Right. And I often see people posting into a Facebook group saying, can someone help translate my book into German, which is like a very broad question for right. the path you've got to go down. Um, so let's, so let's, um, let's get into the uh, detail a little bit. What, what, what should we be doing? How have you approached it? So... Obviously, for 30 books, you know, if I sat down and did the math for it, you know, we're talking about, you know, if I'm doing all of these direct, it's like seven hundred and fifty hundred thousand dollars And that is if you that that's if you pay, you know, the minimum like five thousand dollars a book or something like that. So 
that was just not going to happen. So the the way that I decided to approach this and the way that I think that is the smart way to approach it is and I've had, I've actually counseled some of my author friends to do the same. And, and that is to uh, uh, use services like Babelcube or, and there are a couple of different ones that are similar. Um, and I actually have a list of them at, that I can, I think I can give you after there's, I actually have a, I did a presentation at RAM a couple of years ago, and there's a link on my site that has like a presentation and also some, some, so all of those are on that list. But I advise choosing a couple of uh, uh, languages that you know that maybe are, that, that sell well, but maybe you, you won't benefit more by actually doing them direct. In other words, um, like maybe choose Italian, and go to Babelcube with your Italian translations because they still sell well, but not so well that you're going to regret having uh, tied them up for five years. Okay. And you better um, just explain what Babelcube is for us. Okay, so Babelcube is basically a an ACX type. Uh, I kind of think of them as they basically just handle the money. I that's how I think of them. They're they're my money handlers. They're the ones that are going to. Uh, uh, you know, figure out the finances and pay the tra translator and pay me. And the translator does get the majority up front uh, with Babelcube, but it, that's only fair. I mean, they're the ones that are putting, they're putting a risk into your, your product, your book with, you know, without any pay up front. And so it's, it was perfectly okay with me for that to happen. They I think they make up front like 65% while you make uh, maybe, I, I can't remember what it is. It, 30 or something, because I think that Babelcube takes their share as well. Um, but they, uh, and the other thing is that you get your books back after five years. So it was just kind of, the, you know, for me, it was this is a way to put nothing down, get these books translated, bring in some income, and then I would take that income and place it toward the direct translations that I wanted to do. And those would be the German translations. So Babelcube would be a way into this, but ultimately you would want to fund your own if you can. So you're using yes. using Babelcube, which is a, obviously a profit sharing or right. re revenue sharing so service. Royalty share, yeah, yeah basically. Um, and it and it goes up by tier. You know, I think if you sell like two thousand books, then the, the you know the their the translator share goes down a little bit, and yours goes up a little bit. It's just it's done by by tiers. Um, and yes, so you do want to eventually do your own translations, but I still don't think I would um, I would pay direct for certain languages. Like for example, Spanish is just a really hard sell. I don't know that I would ever, if it weren't for Babelcube, I don't think I would ever put the money into the Spanish translations. I actually was born in Spain and uh, oh. Spanish was my first language. So I feel bad saying, saying that, but my own cousins have told me, you know, to my face that they download my books on pirate sites. So. Oh, okay. I oh, really, yeah, so, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so th those are just some languages I, I don't, I won't put the, the money into. Well, so what are the good, you mentioned Italian. Um, I know Mark has gone down the German route and I'm thinking, potentially Germany for my military aviation novels. I think it's still quite a big area in Germany. So are there, is Germany a, a decent one or are there others you would advise? So uh, German is for me is the absolute top of the, um, the heat. Uh, you know, I think it's going to really depend on the genre. I tried to uh, translate uh, one of my women's fiction books and my, I think my, um, suspense books as well. And those didn't do as well for me, but maybe I did something wrong. Maybe I chose the wrong translator. I don't know. My historical fiction titles, I literally had to just put up. And I think I bonused on those in KU for a year and a half. So, uh, you know, there was, it, it was a no brainer for me. Like at one point, uh, I think uh, my foreign translations were 65% of my income. Wow. Yeah. So you mentioned, you mentioned KU, but just explain, sorry, I, I pretend I know nothing here because I don't think I do actually know anything about this. I mean, KU in in Germany and, and other languages operates in the same way. 
Yeah, they do. So you're just okay. uploading through your KDP account. And yes, okay, you operate exactly the same way. And yes, you could do print and you can take your print wide. And I actually do have started to take my translations as I, now if you do them through BabelTube, you don't get KU and you don't get um, to distribute your, your paperbacks and you actually don't have the right to distribute your own books for five years. But then after five years, you get them back. I think this year I get like 36 books back. Okay. Uh, so, and last year I think it was like 33. So at, at the five year mark, you get your books back and you can distribute them however you want. Uh, but yes, you know, I've started actually taking my, um, my print books now to Ingram's and uploading them there and they do fairly well. They do well. They don't do as well as my U S books. Um, and definitely not as, as well as KU in Germany. Um, but the market actually is getting a bit saturated in Germany as well. So it's a little harder to, to bonus there the way that, that you used to. Okay. So part of it is getting your book then, um, translated and as you say, upload yourself or, or whatever to, to the different markets. The next thing is, is promoting and marketing them. Um, and I know, I know Mark, you know, initially this was a bit of a struggle area for him because he likes writing his ad copy. He likes his ads to be just so he knows everything about testing ads. But if you're not speaking their language, you that's that's quite difficult. So that's a whole different area, isn't it? It is. They don't actually allow you to uh, to write your own copy in those other markets. And I guess they don't really trust us to um, to know what we're what we're saying. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so th even through even through like not through KDP or Advantage, um, either one, you really don't have the option to write your own copy. But you do have the option to use to uh, run AMS ads. And, you know, obviously the same, the AMG ads are, I haven't run any there, but I'm assuming that those are also available in, um, foreign markets as well, but they're all, and, and there are, there are a number of BookBub type, uh, promotion, uh, avenues for for German in particular some of the other languages maybe are a little further further behind when it comes to marketing uh, but you really have a lot of the same avenues for promotion for their foreign markets as you do for uh, US markets I'm just thinking about like Facebook ads for instance you've got mm -hmm. your book you got your book out, out there in in KU land in in Germany in German not just in Germany, mm -hmm. but you then want to be running ads to German language speakers. And that's, that's going to require more translation. Right. But it, you know, at some point, um, at this point I have, you know, I have translation teams that I, they're my go-to people at this point. And whenever I need something like that, you know, I throw it at them. If they have translated that book, a lot of times they'll just do that for me for free. But if not, you know, um, I always offer to, you know, um, uh, you know, to pay them for that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a minimal, minimal cost. So you basically just throw that at a translator that you trust. And it's the same thing as you're doing for, you know, just except in a different language. Yeah. I guess it'd be worth being organized from the beginning to make sure that when you get your book translated, you also get a load of copy alternatives translated and then keep a spreadsheet so that you know what the English version of that is right i think right. that would be um that would be doable then yeah but you need you basically need somebody so at this at this moment i have no translator in german i can go right. i guess online and start trawling for one but it's useful to have somebody who you regularly deal with right so i guess this is where i probably should say how i approached um like the the uh the uh the abcs of it uh so uh I think I said that I, Spanish was my um, my very first language. I didn't actually know a word of English until I was like five years old. My mother is Spanish, and uh, most of her friends were Italian and German and and French, and you know, just I was very comfortable around uh, people, a very multi multicultural uh, uh, group of people, and so um, I always I didn't feel intimidated by the idea of going to someone, you know, I knew who was a native speaker, who um, I knew was a, also a reader. And, you know, I, I could say to them, felt comfortable say, asking them to vet uh, uh, translations for me. So that's kind of how I started. I didn't go on to Babelcube 
expect you to find translators there, although you will. Uh, most of them will want to translate your book in like 10 days. <laughs> and that's a red flag. It's yeah. an absolute no no. You know, a lot of sometimes some of these translators are using uh, uh, software, so, yeah. and which is not a bad thing. I have a translator who started out, started out with me uh, in with German translations who did it all by hand and then bought the software. And then, of course, she went through it and uh, you know, and gave it the personal touch. So the software is not a bad thing, but, you know, I would definitely stay away, beware of people who are promising to turn your book around, even in 30 days, honestly. Yeah, okay. That's just too, it's, it's just not, but anyway, so I, you have to do the legwork. You have to find the translators outside of Babel Cube and then ask them if they will come to Babel Cube with you and agree to do this royalty share. And that's how I approached it. I didn't really go to Babel Cube looking for translators because I just didn't, I didn't feel like I would get the quality translators that way. I felt like I needed to. Um, so what I did is I went to Amazon and I literally, you know, I grabbed it. I made an Excel sheet and um, I started going through, uh, you know, the um, books that I knew that were translated, started with trad books, my trad books, and started writing down names of translators that uh, were available. And then I did the legwork research on them and uh you know, I don't think you have to work quite this hard anymore. It's a little, they're a little more uh, of a known quantity these days, you know, but um, at the time nobody was doing this. So I ended up, you know, I went to, I, to, uh, I think it's Translators Cafe and Pro, I can't th remember the site names right now because it's been five years, but I, I literally looked up their resumes <laughs> and then reached out to them and then asked them if they would come to Bumble Cube with me. And some of them were like, hell no. And some of them were like, sure, you know, so, uh, you know, I started small, you know, just with the, with um, one translator for, you know, for for uh, Italian. And I, I kind of found that in to my good fortune, actually, I kind of found that most of the French translators and German translators did not want to use Babel Cube. There are lots of really quality um Italian translators on on Babel Cube though. So and I think there are are lots, not I would say lots, there are there are qualified translators for all languages, but at at the at and I actually have some friends who use Upworks to find their translators. So the thing is, you know, if, let's say you go to Upworks and you, uh, and they actually found them cheaper there than I paid for mine. I, I didn't, I would say my, the, the cost that I paid, which is about, I would say an average about 5K per book. Um, some a little less, some a little more, depending on the language. Uh, but, you know, I, uh, I have friends who went to Upworks and they paid much less, you know, like, 3,000, 2,000 okay. for German translations. Uh, so the thing is you go, you go to Upworks, you put in your ad, you'll get these translations. And then that this is where you really need to find um, a native speaker who is also a reader and preferably somebody who is familiar with your genre, who you can take those translations to and have them and pay them. You have to, you have to pay them to vet these because nobody wants to. I mean, so they will offer some of them will offer to do it for free. That's not really fair. I, I always paid them and, it, and it's a minimal charge. You know, you just fifty dollars and it's your because they're just looking at a couple of pages and have them vet those pages for you and let and and tell you, uh, you know, whether they're whether they're viable for your books yeah and okay so i've got, got a couple of questions about that um sure one while it occurs to me is it important to have the same translator for a series do translators bring their own little sort of personal lilt to the translation that might jar with the reader if you had different people translating books in a series Absolutely, one hundred percent. I uh, I tend to, I, you know, I actually tend to gravitate now to, you know, the same couple groups of translators for all my books. But absolutely, like they just, it, there, it's no different from, uh, uh, you know, author. Uh, you know, if you're the author of the book, you 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 write a book. You're gonna, you're the way you write a book is gonna be different from some the way somebody else writes it. And I learned a really tough lesson. Uh, uh, about this early on in my translations, I the first one of the first times that I did 
uh, agree to work with a, a, a translator that came to me from Babel Cube. I didn't know anything about her previously. She had all the qualifications. She knew what she was doing. She was, you know, the, um, the, the initial vetting went just great, but then she finished the book. And my, my books, my historical romances tend to be there. You know, I wouldn't say that they're sweet. They're also not steamy and they're definitely not erotica, you know? So uh, this particular translator, uh, I started getting reviews on that book uh, in, in, on the Italian version of the book saying, you know, it's a really sweet, nice, nice story. I don't know why they have to use that language. And, you know, as it All turned right. out, I had somebody um, go through the book and this was also the only time that I did not use um, a translator proofreader team. Uh, after that, I decided I was not doing any more translations unless the translator was willing to work with a proofreader of my choosing. Right. Uh, you know, so uh, as it turned out, she wrote the book very much like an erotica book and it was extremely gritty and, you know, it just wasn't my style at all. Okay. We pulled the book. Yeah. So, so you've built up a team and to the point where you go to, presumably if I went to Babel Cube, they could pro provide a translator, right? I wouldn't know much about their background. No, they're not going to. It's oh, not, not. They, oh, it's not like that? No, oh, no okay. they will not. They will not put you together with translators. You basically, you're going to go there as an author. It's very uh, translator centric in the sense that in the beginning, authors couldn't even search for translators. Like it was very much, you know, uh, built for the translator to find the work that they wanted to find. They, um, and, and their contracts are geared toward making sure the translator gets paid. You know, um, it's very translator centric. Um, which is fine. Um, now it, they've made it to where you are able to, uh, search for translators. Um, but uh, I think I just kind of got off the question. What did you just ask yeah, me? Yeah, sorry. I, was, sorry. I, I thought maybe Babel Cube would would oh, um, supply yeah. translators, but they don't do that. You so you you no, bring in. You'll your... put your profile up, and they and they will offer to do the book. Okay. And you know you'll put your profile up, and then you put your books up, and then they'll and you'll ask. You'll there's a section for um for you know a a script basically that they have to translate, and then when they offered the, for the book, then they'll return that script in, in, uh, in, in, uh, whatever language yeah. you've requested. Okay. And then that's what you vet. Okay. But again, this is your route into it. The preferred way is to upfront it yourself a bit like audio books, I guess is the same, right. same pattern here, but quite a big upfront. Right. So 5,000 roughly us dollars for, per book, obviously word count would affect that and, and so on. Um, are some languages more expensive than others? Yes. Uh, French um, is a little less than um, German. I have been able to get away with doing about 5,000 a book for German German, German translations. Uh, Italian translations are more like two, three, something like that. Um, uh, Spanish. I haven't actually done any of those direct and don't plan on it. <laughs> uh, so I can't really tell you that. Um, Portuguese, I also have not uh, done those direct either, but that is another language that, uh, um, that you can find a lot of really qualified translators on, on Babel Cube. And the language, languages that I have done are, you know, Dutch, myself, the languages I've done myself, Dutch, um, German, Italian, French, and Spanish. So five okay. different languages. And Dutch is, for instance, a, a big enough population to be worth it because it's quite, quite a small country. I'm not sure what the population is top of my head, but maybe, I don't know, I'm going to guess 20 million, something like that, 20, 30. I'll have to look so it up I, now. Yeah, so no, I, I don't really think so. Like I would never approach, I would never do a Dutch translation um, uh, direct because for that very reason. And actually I ended up feeling so bad about um, the way the performance of that book through Babel Cube that I ended up paying my uh, my uh, Dutch translator a little right. bit because I felt like, I just felt bad. Um, now that I have those particular books back and I do have them now they're, they've been reverted to me, I'm gonna try them through uh, Kobo, which Kobo actually um, says, they, they've told me that they, they do have a, a very active Dutch uh, uh, readership. Okay. 
That's good, so. yeah. 17.28 million. So I wasn't far off, was I? My guess, about 20 million. But, um, <clears throat> okay. Yeah, that's a bit unfortunate, isn't it, for the Dutch? Because, you know, yeah. they, they speak a language that's not widely spoken. As, I right. suppose there might be a bit of crossover with Afrikaans, but that's that's about all I can think of, was Germany's a big country. Um, France is French is spoken widely. Spanish, I know you left Spain and by the sounds of it, you're not going back in terms no, of... No, actually, writing. I might even retire there. I love oh, okay, Spain. Yeah. But, but uh, I don't uh, think I will write books for them. <laughs> no. But Spanish is, you know, next to Mandarin, probably in terms of where second most widely spoken language on the planet, I'm going to guess. Um, so that's... Although that's an interesting question, actually. Spanish in in Mexico, Spanish in Spain, Spanish in other South American countries. I know Portuguese is widely spoken there as well. Is it the, would the same Spanish translation work across those countries? So, the, you know, especially if you're doing it through Babelcube, you don't really have the option to do two. Uh, and the answer to that question is no. And it's so funny because, you know, here, I, I actually, I, you know, I'm a little rusty, although my husband says that that's bull and I speak fluently and I do, I actually do. I mean, it was my first language. I speak Spanish fluently. And so I thought, because I can, that, uh, you know, that Spanish would be the easiest one for me. Uh, I can read it. And a lot of times, you know, some of the stuff that they turn in uh, to me, uh, I will, you know, I, I stopped even vetting them at first, in, in, you know, after a while, because I, I, I would, I would read them and I could read it just fine. And then I would give it to my Spanish cousins. They'd go, this is terrible. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I don't, uh, but w one of the things I found is that you can't please both, uh, you know, uh, the, the Spaniards from Spain and you can't and the, uh, you know, the South American Spaniards at the same time, you just cannot, they just are not the same, uh, you know, they're not the same uh, dialects at all. And if you do it uh, with a Castilian translator, then the uh, those in, uh, I, I think they're more accustomed, your safest doing Castilian. Okay. Um, but if you do go the other way and use a South American translator, that poor translator just will get just the the the, the Spanish the 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 more um, how the, I'm trying to figure out the best way to say this the more proper Spanish right. uh, okay uh, speaking people will just literally crucify them. It's, it's complicated, this isn't it? And even actually, I come to think of it, in Spain, I remember learning. First time I sort of learned bits of Spanish from we obviously it's quite close for us to go on holidays to the south there. And a couple of times, one very memorable time with a waitress kind of blanking me and being a bit dismissive and annoyed that even I was speaking Spanish. But I realized, of course, we were in the middle of Catalonia and Catalan was very widely spoken. And for some people, it was quite a thing. And they didn't like the idea that an English person had learnt non-Catalonian Spanish and was using Spanish words so it, it wasn't the common thing but it happened occasionally so that even within Spain I can imagine this being right. a slightly fraught area that you've obviously tackled and have got your teeth into but I can start to see why this is an area unexplored by lots of authors yeah so it you know it's it's like I said it's just it's, it's funny because it's um out of even now five years down the line and more than 130 translations uh into this Spanish terrifies me more right. <laughs> than any of the other languages. Um, you just, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem possible to please everybody in that, with no. that language. And, and I thought that I would find some um, issue with uh, uh, French and Canadian French. Mm. And I just did not at all. I actually even, um, I had it translated by, um, you know, a, a French woman, one of my books by a French woman, and then read by a, uh, a Canadian, uh, French Canadian woman. And, you know, it's just not, a, it was just not an issue at all. Um, there was, there was none. Yeah. That's funny, and, isn't it? And even with German, high German, and, uh, yeah. there's just not, there's no issue. It's just with Spanish. Yes. Quite particular. Well, there you go. Um, okay. So, so you've given a kind of a, an outline for a good progression into this and Babel Cube's a really interesting one to, to look out, uh, at, um, is it getting easier for people? For instance, if somebody thought, well, okay, I can upfront this. Um, I want to do this myself. Is it easier than it was when you started five years ago? I think so, 100%. I think that, first of all, there's there are lots... There are many more translators that, I mean, that are visible. You can, you can go, you know, I mean, any... 
I'm sure you know 10 people who have had their books translated and, um, you know, and therefore you have, you know, 10 translators possibly, you know, uh, who uh, potentially who, who, you know, who you can go to uh, to uh, request a quote for, from, um, you know, so it, it's definitely a lot easier these days uh, than it was back then. Cause back then really it was, uh, it literally nobody was doing it. There were, there was no visibility uh, where the translators were con- are concerned. It was just, they were just not out there at all. And um, I mean, they were, obviously I found some, but it was not, it, I think it probably, that whole process, initial process probably took me five, six months to to pull together. And these days, um, you know, there, there, there are quite a few uh, available trans- translators um, out there. I've actually, you know, at this point, translated most of my list, so I've shared mine <laughs> with yeah. other authors. Yeah, well, I'll ask you a bit about what you can share in a moment, but kind of final question, I suppose, for this area is, is has it been worth it for you? It sounds like a lot of work. You know what your figures are for your English markets. Ultimately, is this is this a worthwhile endeavor for you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I just, uh, like I said, at one point, it was um, easily 65% of my income. And, um, and I do well. So, I mean, that's saying a lot, uh, uh, these days it's not quite that, uh, my translations, I, that's not to say that I don't think it's possible to do that, you know, to repeat that success, um, with new books. But at the time I was actually putting out a new German translation every three months, which I think is, you know, as it is with the American market, the U S market, I think that rapid release does help. And, um, you know, so, uh, but my prime you know, with that is somewhat done at this point. So um, I still make really great money there. Uh, good, well, good money, but not not as much as I did back then. Still worth it. Um, you know, at this point, you know, uh, I don't have a whole lot to do anymore except to, um, you know, run AMS ads for them and occasional uh, promos. And in fact, sometimes, uh, well, these days, uh, you know, I, with this, with 17 authors, sometimes I actually forget to do that. And they're just kind of managing themselves. They're, you know, they're not, they're just out there doing what they're doing. Yeah. Well, so you've given us a lot of, uh, food for thought on this area. I think people are very interested in, in getting their teeth into this as you have. I think you might be able to put together some resources. You, you mentioned quite a lot of different resources, Tony. Is there something you might be able to do for us? Maybe a one pager? Absolutely. Uh, I, I will, I'll send you a link and uh, you can post that. Okay. Well, as in the great tradition, I'm now going to make up a, um, uh, a URL for that. So if we say selfpublishingformula.com forward slash translate, simple as that. And then we'll, we'll get people to, um, to arrive there and they'll get this PDF with resources. So one last thing that I probably should mention is that I think that contracts really scare people. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there are, there are so many different ways to approach. Uh, one of the things that I, I learned from having gone through the, the whole Babel Cube route is what, you know, they're, they're you know, trans, the translators out there are working, they're working writers who, who want to work. There are a million different ways to uh, formulate a contract. I've done them everywhere every, from, you know, um, you know, all the money up front to, you know, a certain percent up front and then, you know, a certain amount every month until the a cap is met, met. I mean, there are like a million hybrid contracts, whatever you can conceive, you know, is probably possible if you find the right translator. Uh, that, and I know that people usually ask me uh, about uh, the, you know, your rights in Germany. And uh, there's, there's a workaround with that. The translators do own the rights in Germany. Uh, but there is a workaround that my one of my German translators actually helped me to kind of sort of put together. And so it's in my contract. And I think I can I can probably give you a sample of that contract also, which I would advise any writer to take to their, you know, um, yeah. their attorney. I'm not an attorney. Use it as a so, starting point. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but, you know, so long as you are paying your translator uh, a a royalty, which you know, is specified in the contract. And for the, for me, um, we sort of determined that it was, you know, once we re- reached a cap and that cap was, let's say, $5,000, $6,000, then 
the trans, you know, all monies would stop unless they request it from me. And the translation that they are agreeing to, to um, that the, the, the percentage they're agreeing to is like point zero 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 one, which is such a minimal amount that it doesn't even make it worth asking for. So, uh, uh, so you have to, you, but you have to address. Right. A, yeah. so, a, so the royalty becomes a technicality, a legal technicality so that you are, right. that's the, basis of your relationship okay i understand that well that sounds like a really useful thing maybe to include on the pdf or the link to that little bit of contract would be great um tanya time has rattled rattled past i've gone my camera's even stopped above me but one other <laughs> one other one's working so that's brilliant thank you so much indeed i'm jealous of uh, the snow that you've got out there we have such great damp weather most of the time in the uk and uh, it looks so beautiful out your window well it's very blinding white <laughs> yeah <laughs> Blinded by the white, but uh, but that's nice. Tanya, thank you so much indeed. I'll remind people again of that URL, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash translate. And uh, we will see. This is obviously an area that's, that's only going one way, I think. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Tanya Ann Crosby. And just to remind you, there is a giveaway, as we mentioned in that interview, Tanya's put together for us, worth grabbing if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash translate. There you go. So Tanya said straight away when I said what countries work, what don't. And I think she said uh, in interviews, while since I did the interview, that she's Spanish, well, she was born in Spain, I think, and but really struggles to get works going in Spain. But Germany was the number one foreign language market as far as she was concerned and i think you found something similar haven't you yeah i mean i've mentioned it before i think but i mean i i, I had three the beatrix rose series translated into spanish uh french and german and the i haven't been able to get anything going with uh, either latin language uh, but there's latin you got it translated into latin oh dear here that's, we go i mean that's brave you do know the french and italian and spanish are latin languages don't you Oh dear. Okay, we'll 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 pick, I'll educate you after the podcast. But um, yes, the Latin languages didn't take off, but the the German one was was a complete different ball game. Um, it's it was it was effective from the start, and it has been really really good. I mean, usually uh, you know four figures a day from Germany, uh, and and has been pretty consistent all year. And that's not even with the full catalogue yet. I think I've got twelve Milton books done um, with plans to get the others ready um by the end of the year um it's quite funny actually um so <laughs> someone found out the translator who's done it's not hard to find out the translator who did some of the books and contacted them and name dropped me and said that i'd recommended them and he right. emailed me and thanked me for that for the recommendation and i didn't recommend them i don't know who the person is i don't recognize the name so that was a little bit naughty um, but you didn't recommend them because you don't really you want no, to have this person available I, for you i told him that i, I said look, i can keep you busy for the next yeah. for all all the next year um it's not that not, you wouldn't recommend it but. no no definitely when once i'm out of this process there'll be three or four translators i'll be able to recommend um but at the moment i, I have about 15 books that need to be translated so i don't i don't want them doing any other other work mm. they might want to change i don't know but it's not in my interest to um kind of have them focus is the focus going elsewhere but no but that's me being selfish i suppose but the the um the actual, you know, the experience of doing it in German is has been great. Um, mm. Some challenges, you know, it's like any any communication that you need that you'll just assume you can write it in in English, from comments on Facebook ads um, to emails to your newsletter. So I've got you know twelve hundred people on the list now in Germany, and I do monthly newsletters. I don't speak any German, so that all has to be um, translated. And things like, you know, kind of, uh, resp they'll email back in German. Um, and I found Google Translate is very good now. Um, DeepL is another very good translation um, right. program. So you can just plug in, you give it a piece of text. It works out what the language is. It will translate it into English. And then if you want to reply in um, German, you just write in English, tell it to translate in German. And it seems to be reasonably accurate now, um, okay. at least for those kind of short, that short correspondence. So yeah, oh, it's um, it's going well. So one of the things about the Google Translate, and you see, do you see some hilarious examples of this? Is that we structure sentences very differently, don't we? I mean, Germany, famously, if if somebody speaks word for word 
the German translation to English, the sentences sound hilarious to us because they're very strange. But you reckon the trans the AI behind these translation bots now is getting good enough to reorganize that aspect of the sentence so it makes sense at the other end? I think so. I mean, what I do is I'll put a PS at the end saying translated by Google, just just so that, that yeah, that's yeah. that's known. But I think yeah, they are getting better. I, mean, I don't. I know DeepL is is one of the is pretty um, well regarded in in that in that form. So. I think it's it's getting. I don't think it, we. I don't personally think we're quite close enough for software to translate something with nuance like a novel. Mm-hmm. But for a very thank you for your email, enjoy the book and keep reading. I think that's not that's not quite so complicated. Not quite at the Babelfish stage yet. Then none of this no, will be needed. No, no Douglas Adams references in this podcast. Thank you very much. Lots of Douglas Adams references. Um, I'm reading a Nathan Van Koop's time travel novel at the moment, and I'm very pleased to see both a Douglas Adams and Star Wars references, of course. In there. Are you going to give him a really brutal feedback? Ha! No, I'm not. I'm going to be very polite. I'm gonna, <laughs> it's a good book. I'm enjoying it. Page turning. <laughs> Um, great. Okay. Look, thank you very much indeed. Just a reminder, 101 is open at the moment. Should you be interested in that foundation course, tell you how to set yourself up to be a commercially successful self-published author or put everything in place to give you that best chance of being so. Thank you very much indeed to our guest, Tanya Ann Crosby, this week. Don't forget the self-publishing formula course. Uh, 101 is open at the moment. You go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash 101. All that remains for me to say is that it's a goodbye from me and I'm going to say from him because he's dropped out on my little Zoom link. It's a goodbye from him as well. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.